Hello again, Gary Stearman. Time for another edition of Prophecy in the News. Are you a prophecy watcher? Do you believe that prophecy is being fulfilled for the latter days? Well, if so, you might be an apocalypticist. <laughs> it's a big word. We're going to talk about it. Well, it is a big word, and it's a big subject. You know, in a recent article that I wrote, uh, I used that word a lot of times uh, just to make a point. And in fact, the new Third International Dictionary of the English Language by Merriam-Webster uh, says this, apocalypticism is ap uh, apocalyptic expectation. Now, don't expect me to get all of these right because it's a, it's a six-syllable word. <laughs> And that's enough for me. Apocalyptic expectation, a doctrine distinguished by the expectation of an imminent event and the end of the present temporal world, the final destruction of the unrighteous in a purging holocaust engulfing the earth and the resurrection of the righteous to a purified world of bliss. So that's apocalypticism as given by Merriam-Webster in their new Third International Dictionary. Well, I am an apocalypticist myself. Do you believe that prophecy is being re revealed for the latter days? Uh, you, you're probably an apocalypticist. In particular, uh, do you believe that, that prophecy points to the near fulfillment of end-time events, including the rapture, the Great Tribulation, the Second Coming of Christ? Well. If the answer to this question is yes, yes, and yes, you might be an apocalypticist. In fact, you are fascinated by apocalypticism. By the way, the Greek word from which this giant English word comes is apocalypsis, and it is the word which is directly translated in our Bible as revelation. Unveiling, it's the name of the last book in the Bible, the Apocalypse. You know, the Apostle Paul uh, uses uh, this term many times. Uh, I'm going to read 2 Thessalonians 1.7, in which Paul says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And the word revealed in that sentence is, in a, is a translation of the Greek word apocalypsis. That's what we're waiting for, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ in the rapture, it's imminent. You know, apocalypticists sometimes feel a little bit of guilt for being so excited about the nearness of the rapture. Uh, they're a bit afraid that maybe they'll be looked on askance by people who are too sophisticated and who believe the rapture is just for uh, the superstitious. Uh, but worst of all, <clears throat> you may find that as an apocalypticist, you vacillate between absolute certainty in the near, nearness of Christ's coming, and perhaps a bit of doubt. And you say to yourself, am I being, am I overdoing this thing? Am I, and am, I, am I being too enthusiastic? You think about all those degreed theologians, for example, out there uh, with uh, THDs behind their names, who totally deny the rapture in the first place. And you say, well, these people know more than I do. But listen, I've read the Bible. The edifice of Christianity is strengthened by over 300 Old Testament references to the Messiah that were fulfilled by the coming of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And furthermore, going into the New Testament and looking forward, we find that there are just as many uh, prophecies concerning the apocalypse. Now, the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ begins with the rapture of the church, and it is an unveiling only uh, to believers, to us who are, quote, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13. The blessed hope, then, is the unveiling. Now, it's called the rapture. It's called the catching away of the church for us who are in the body of Christ, we are caught up in a kind of a paradox. 
Apocalypticists are often heard uh, being the brunt of jokes by people who say, oh, you're taking this thing too far. Uh, cleverly dismissive remarks. No doubt you've heard the, the most familiar one, which goes something like this. Uh, well, some people say they are premillennial. Some people say they are postmillennial. Some are uh, amillennial. <clears throat> I don't believe any of that stuff. Me, I'm just a panmillennialist. I believe it's all going to pan out somehow. Now, that's an old, old, old joke, but it's, it's the uh, supreme put-off. Uh, if you are a Christian looking for the rapture, uh, you, you may have found that people are going to find a way to make fun of you. And yet, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of our faith today. And, and let me just say this. During the days uh, when the apostles walked the earth, uh, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s A.D., before the destruction of the temple, uh, the apostles were encouraging their followers, new converts, saying, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. In particular, Paul, writing to the Corinthians and the Thessalonians, uh, over and over again wrote, for, wrote to them with the expectation of Christ's imminent return. Now, all that changed toward the end of the first century, uh, and with the death of the Apostle Paul just before the end of the first century, we discover that there is a general falling away of Christian belief in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Clement of Rome uh, wrote a, an encouraging epistle in which he said, look, look, uh, you may have lived, and I hear you saying that all of these things were predicted to come to pass in the days of our fathers, and we're all still here, and, and we're getting discouraged. And Clement said, don't be discouraged. Keep looking. Well, as a matter of fact, what happened in the second, third, and fourth centuries with uh, Israel's scattering to the four winds, with the great persecution of the church in the reigns of uh, Domitian and Hadrian, Roman emperors, Christians found themselves under siege, and Jesus still had not returned. Furthermore, Israel had been scattered, and Israel's temple had been destroyed. And so the idea of the imminent return of Christ was, was cooling off, and it cooled even further in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries, and then with the uh, writings of Augustine, uh, the city of God, and so forth, the church began to be seen not as... Uh, the recipient of Christ's imminent return, but rather as a political force. The leaders of the church said the only way we're going to survive is by coexisting with the monarchies of Europe and by becoming more or less a statist institution. And thus the Roman church was born under uh, the, uh, the Juris Doctor, the, the doctor of theology, uh, St. Augustine. And Augustine was not looking for the Lord to return at all. As a matter of fact, uh, Augustine was not an apocalypticist. Augustine uh, believed that the church existed for one reason only, and that is to uh, spread itself around the world <coughs> and to progressively make the world a better and better place until at some point in the future, the world would be stabilized by the presence of the church. It would be uh, turned into a kind of a utopian, uh, beautiful place where all the people loved each other. There would be no more wars. And at that point, Jesus would return. That was Augustine's idea in, in the city of God and, and other uh, writings of his. And so uh, the church sort of lost its appetite for apocalyptic scripture. That is to say, the idea that Jesus could imminent, imminently return, uh, and then following that would come a series of judgments which would bring Israel up as the head of nations. Apocalypticists, in addition to being the brunt of condescending jokes, uh, are also the brunt of people who don't like to discuss politics and religion at the dinner table. <laughs> you may have noticed that. You may, the, the, the rapture of the church, for example, may be one of your very favorite topics, 
and you discover you can't talk about it at the dinner table at all, not while I'm eating my mashed potatoes, says Granddad, because I get all upset when you begin to to air your opinions about uh, the future of the church, and I'm sure you've all been through that one. Well, after the passing of the apostles, the world turned to practical matters, but something changed in 1897. The first Zionist Congress was held in Basel, Switzerland. And when that was held, Israel began to come back into the land. Uh, actually, it had b- begun a few years uh, earlier in 1892 when the first Jews returned uh, to Israel from Kharkov in Russia, and they founded uh, small cities like Patatikva, the Gate of Hope, or Rishon Latzion, the first in Zion. And of course, those cities have grown up to be very large now. Tel Aviv, Haifa. Uh, Jerusalem, uh, the population is expanding in Israel, Uh, the Jews are coming back to the land, and their adversaries, as prophesied, are trying to chase them out of the land. All of which makes us, as apocalypticists, very excited, because this was prophesied to happen in the last days. We are looking Uh, for the return of Christ imminently, just as they did in the first century before the destruction of the temple. There was a long intermission from about A.D. 97, 98, until about 1897, when Israel began to return. And during that intermission, people were not expecting an apocalypse so much as they were expecting the church to take over the institutions of this world. Well, we no longer live in that expectation expectation. Instead, we, uh, we have returned to fundamental principles of Bible doctrine, one of them being that the epistles that were directed to those first century Christians are also written to us in the latter days, and only God could have done that. Absolutely remarkable. Now, let me continue in a moment. First, I'd like to uh, tell you about our Uh, monthly magazine, Prophecy in the News, 48 pages, full color, and uh, always containing several articles on prophetic research, plus a full catalog of resource materials. I think Prophecy in the News has a greater resource of books, DVDs, videos of various kinds, study helps than any other magazine in the world, and it's worth it for the resource materials alone. But uh, you'll find what I consider to be the top of the best prophetically oriented research articles that you'll find today. $34.95 plus shipping and handling for a one-year subscription. But in order to uh, get you interested, in order to to help you make up your mind to subscribe for a year, (coughs) I've got a special package offer. We're calling it the 2013 subscription package. and it will include, with your one-year subscription for thirty-four ninety-five, free shipping, by the way, on all of this, it will include these three books, each worth about twelve ninety-five. It'd be about thirty-nine dollars worth of books, yours absolutely free with the magazine subscription. The first book, Seeing God Through the Human Body, a doctor's meditation on the human miracle. It's a great book. Second book. A Scientific Approach to Biblical Mysteries by Robert uh, Fade. Excellent book. And finally, you may have heard of Patrick Heron. The title of this one is Apocalypse Soon. Well, you know, I think Patrick Heron is apocalypticist. (laughs) Just call the 800 number on your screen and ask for the 2013 subscription package when you call 3495 free shipping. Well, let's continue our discussion of apocalypticism. You know, the one thing about apocalypticists is that they make better witnesses for Christ because they believe in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Of course, the big one, Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, if you believe that, you believe it. If you don't, You try to make up some kind of an excuse. Uh, This is really not talking about a virgin. It's talking about a young woman. It doesn't have to be an actual virgin birth. But in fact, prophecy says that it was, and I believe that it was. And that conviction 
adds weight to your testimony. Of course, Isaiah 53, 3 through 6 says he's despised and rejected of men, describing what happened to Christ. Man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Wow. You know, all that took place. It's really true, and it was a real fulfilled prophecy. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And there's the whole gospel laid out by Isaiah in Isaiah 53. And when you go uh, at, to teach someone else about the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're talking about fulfilled prophecy. That's the first good reason why an apocalypticist makes a better witness because he believes in fulfilled prophecy. The second aspect uh, of his testimony is that he believes that future eschatology, that is the doctrine of the end times, is just as dependable as past eschatology. And so he presents the gospel on the basis that things are going to shortly come to pass that have been talked about in the Bible for thousands of years. Ezekiel 38 is a good example. Uh, you can talk to people about Ezekiel's prophecy in Ezekiel 38, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God. And so now we're talking about a prophecy of this mysterious Gog. And a lot of people, of course, have said uh, long before me that in this little compact opening to Ezekiel 38, you, you have these words, Gog, Magog, and hidden in there is the word chief prince, which in Hebrew is Rosh, which is the, the name of the state of Russia. And so you have Gog, Magog, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal. All of those are place names of the ancient Scythians. And so the Bible names Russia. And then it goes on and says, prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth. So God is saying to this latter-day entity, I believe to be Russia, I'm going to pull you forth. You're not going to want to come, but I'm going to pull you into the fray. All thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer, and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Now, here we have a list of modern nations, Magog, Russia, Persia, Iran, Ethiopia, which still exists, Libya, which still exists, Togarma, which would be Turkey, Gomer, Germany and Eastern Europe, all of these are going to unite under some future agreement under the worst terms you can imagine. Something horrible is going to break out in the Middle East and Russia is going to be drawn into the fray and according to Ezekiel, there Russia will find destruction. Well, if you read the news today, you discover <coughs> that the Russian army is infiltrating very rapidly back into the Middle East, mostly through Syria, headed for Damascus. And you, as an apocalypticist, are saying, well, this could be the prelude to the fulfillment of Ezekiel's uh, prophecy. You have long recognized that this setting is unfolding even as we speak. And you know, if you go on into Ezekiel's prophecy, uh, in Ezekiel 38, 18, you find something very interesting. The Lord says through Ezekiel, and it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. And so here we have a timed prophecy in Scripture. 
And if you're an apocalypticist, you say, ah, here's something I can actually nail down. At the same time as this Russian invasion uh, to uh, concerning Gog, the Lord God says, my fury shall come up in my face. Now, uh, there are many, many indicators all the way through the Old Testament and on into the New that this is simply a way of saying it is an expression for uh, the day of the Lord. It shall come to pass at the same time as Gog's invasion that God's fury shall come up in his face. In other words, we find uh, some evidence here for timing uh, an event concerning the day of the Lord. In these verses... The apocalypticist naturally sees the apocalypse, the revealing, the unveiling. You know, this brings me to uh, an interesting question, and I call it the Century 21 Paradox. Uh, are we living in the last days? <clears throat> A question we put to ourselves all the time. Are we really? Uh, did the Lord choose you from before the foundation of the world? Or did you choose to follow him? Of course, the answer is yes. But, of course, that answer is impossible because <laughs> it doesn't seem that both halves of that question could be answered in the same way. Well, that's the paradox that you get when you ask, are we living in the last days? You know, uh, the question of the last days when the apostles use that term, they're ref they are referring to the closing days of the church age, last days. In the broadest sense, however, they're describing the general deterioration that has taken place since they actually lived and from that time to the present, which is about 2,000 years. So the question, are we living in the last days, is paradoxical in nature. Uh, it deals with God's general program which will culminate in the day of the Lord. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, uh, 3 and 5, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And here Peter is simply pointing to the paradox that the scoffers take advantage of. Uh, there shall come in the last days scoffers. When did those scoffers first come? Well, I think about 2,000 years ago. Uh, people uh, who were uh, led to Christ uh, lived at a time of great, great difficulty. In the, in the days of the Roman Empire, when the apostles were actually out preaching the gospel, it was possible to, to be a great scoffer. Uh, it was possible to say, oh, you say this is happening, but we don't believe so. And furthermore, look at what the Roman Empire is doing to believers. Peter was writing in, a, in an almost paradoxical way. Uh, he was writing to his own following, but he was also writing to us. And so for me to say we're living in the last days carries me all the way back to Peter, who said, yes, we are living in the last days. In other words, the last days have unfolded throughout the millennia, throughout century after century after century, each century providing a group of clues or signs that are added on to the preceding centuries. But all of this is subsumed under the general heading, last days. Isn't that fascinating? And if you are an apocalypticist, you are uh, seized with a desire to make this work in your mind. You know, you go back to Hosea 5, 14 through 6, 3, and you come up with a, an amazing prophecy. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, as a young lion of the house of Judah. I will, even I, even I will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. That's already taken place, you know. And seek my face, and in their affliction they will seek me early. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he hath torn, he will heal us. 
He hath smitten, he will bind us up after two days. Will he revive us in the third day? He will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Hosea wrote that prophecy, which is one of the greatest time prophecies in the Bible, to tell us to be looking after two days. Well, you know, it's been 2,000 years. And we find from a study of the Antinicene fathers, the church fathers who lived just after the death of the Apostle John, that they actually believed in a millennial day concept of timekeeping. Uh, the Epistle of Barnabas talks about uh, each millennium being as one of seven days, and the seventh day would be the kingdom millennium. And right now, according to that reckoning, we're in the sixth day, and it would be the time uh, when Hosea prophesied after two days uh, will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up. You know what? Israel has been revived starting in 1897. And the third day he will raise us up. I see Israel being raised up right now. And I think many of you do, too. They are going through some terrible difficulties. But they are all the difficulties that have been described in prophecy. And so we can expect them. We can put them in perspective. You know, every month... Uh, uh, we write articles on Bible prophecy that talk about subjects such as the one I'm talking about today. A and we include several articles in each issue of Prophecy in the News, 48 pages, uh, full color. And, by the way, this magazine is loaded with resource materials, uh, books, DVDs, uh, study materials of all sorts to help you uh, understand Bible prophecy. We carry, I think, the largest catalog of Christian books devoted to Bible prophecy of any publication uh, in print today. And you can subscribe to Prophecy in the News uh, for the year 2013, all the months ahead for one year, for only $34.95 with free shipping. But just to get you a little bit more interested, not only uh, will you get free shipping, you'll get three free books in the bargain as well. This one, Seeing God Through the Human Body, a doctor looks at the miracles of the inner workings of the body. They would have had to be created by God. A Scientific Approach to Biblical Mysteries by Robert W. Fade, <clears throat> a wonderful book on Christianity and the scientific method. And finally, by Patrick Heron, this book called Apocalypse Soon. Uh, these three books would amount to about $39, and they're yours absolutely free when you order a year's subscription to Prophecy in the News for $34.95. Free shipping for the magazine and the books. Call the 800 number on your screen. And we hope to hear from you soon. In the meantime, Gary Stearman reminding you to keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported program made possible by our many friends around the world. Be sure you tune in every day for breaking news and our daily prophetic news updates at prophecyinthenews.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prophecyinthenews.